Praise the Lord. All right. Well, it is such a joy uh, for me to be here with you this morning or this afternoon. And uh, I am a local to Boston, but also a missionary kid. And so, as Finney mentioned, you're kind of in this in-between world. Are you, am I an American? Am I an African? What am I? Ultimately, I landed on, uh, I belong to the kingdom of God. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay right there. Um, so, I, I, as Finney mentioned, I do have the privilege of serving at the Send Relief Center as the director there, and we have several different initiatives, and uh, if anything that I say during this time stirs you, uh, I would just love to talk to you afterwards so that we can brainstorm together how your community, how your group of friends, how your family could serve uh, this greater Boston area, or maybe where you're coming from. I know some of you are coming from different parts of the country, or also maybe some people coming from Canada as well. Um, we would love. I would love to talk to you about how you can serve in those spaces as well. Now, today I was asked to answer the question, how can we effectively engage the poor in Boston? How can we effectively engage the poor in Boston? And so to do that, I want to turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 3. And uh, as we turn to Acts chapter 3, what we're going to see, if you remember... Uh, from reading through the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 is when the church was officially born, and, uh, and we saw an amazing account of what the church devoted themselves to at the end of Acts chapter 2. And then we get right into Acts chapter 3, which is kind of like normal life now. What does it look like? What is our first glimpse of these, of these apostles, these disciples who are part of that early church as they live out their lives on mission? So Acts chapter 3 is a glimpse into that, those first days. Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1, hear the word of the Lord. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and recognized him as the one who sat at the gate, at the beautiful gate, of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or, or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the, and the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of all, of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom, from, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from away from your wickedness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, this passage is centrally concerned with showing you and I 
that there is power in the name of Jesus. There's power to heal and to save. And yet woven throughout this text is God's concern for the poor and a Christ-like method that, that we see the apostles demonstrate on how to engage those who are desperate. And that's really what I want to focus our time on today is looking at God's heart for the poor and for the desperate and this method that we see that we can also take from as we look to engage the poor in our communities. And so I'm going to have three points for you, but those three points won't start uh, for just a few minutes, but I'll, I'll clue you in so you take notes and, uh, and get them down. So let's, let's set the scene here. Verse 1 sets the scene for us. It says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, at the ninth hour. Now, the ninth hour means 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And it was standard for Jewish people back then, living in the area of Jerusalem, to pray three times a day. And so they would pray in the morning, they would pray at 3 o'clock, and they would pray at sunset. And the phrase going up is very literal, right? It's, they were on their way up to Jerusalem, up to this elevated part of the city where the temple was. And so you can imagine Peter and John are walking up this hill, and they're going towards the temple. But this isn't just a walk. There's something different about this. This is something that the text indicates is very intentional. Let's look at what the text says and what the text doesn't say. The text says that they were going up at the hour of prayer. It doesn't say that they were going to pray, but it says that they were going up at the hour of prayer. And so why is that important? That's important because they were being strategic. These apostles were looking for a place where people would be present. They were intentional. They were on mission. They were doing what Jesus had called them to do, to be his witnesses first in Jerusalem. Now, again, you see the strategy happen over and over and over throughout the, the book of Acts. The apostles aim at where there's a place where there's a lot of Jewish people who are gathered together praying, and then they try to engage them with the gospel. They try to show them what the good news is. And I wonder if you and I were more intentional in our lives if we could see some amazing outcomes happen as well? What if we could be strategic and, and identify different places in our communities where we could go and frequent? When I was church planting in Providence, Rhode Island, I had these things called proclamation points. And so once a week, I would go to each of these proclamation points and I would just spend an hour in each of those locations and just pray that God would open the door for me to have conversations with people about who he is. And so I went to a laundromat and that laundromat, I, I had my own laundry set at home. I didn't need to do laundry there, but I'd bring a bag of gym clothes and I'd go to that laundromat and I would just sit there and bring a commentary or a Bible or, or something while I was doing my laundry. And without fail, I would have a gospel conversation with people. Sometimes they would just come up and say, what in the world is that book you're reading? That is a big book. Uh, or other times it was just other people who were fascinated by the fact that I was in a laundromat because I was in a community at that time that was only 6% uh, Caucasian. And so they didn't understand why this white boy was sitting in this laundromat doing his laundry. So it was a great conversation starter. What are the proclamation points that you might have in your community? We see that the apostles here are intentional. They're on mission. They're looking for ways that they can share the gospel and make disciples. And so it's in this journey as they're walking up this hill towards the temple that suddenly Luke introduces an amazing character, a character that's central to us understanding God's heart for the poor and our way of engaging. Look at verse 2. It says, A man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Now, if you've ever traveled to any developing nations, then you know that this is something that's pretty standard. You see people who will carry someone who is lame or has a handicap and bring them to a street corner or bring them to an entrance to a major building or to a major part of the city and will place them there so that they might ask for people to give. And that's one way that if they can't provide for the family because of some handicap or some other reason, that they can actually contribute to the income of their family. And so you see this uh, all over the developing world, and you see that a little bit here in Boston as well. And in situations like this, uh, you and I, I think, need to remember that it is true that you do see these people in Boston who are oftentimes on street corners or, at, or entrances to different buildings. If you were to go into downtown Boston right now, you would see that there are people on the Boston Common on a regular basis right around that main fountain. You would see that there are people around downtown crossing, around the entrances to the subway. You would see that over by City Hall Plaza in front of the New England Center and Home for Veterans, there's a collection of people that gather right there. If you were to walk down to 
uh, South Station, you would see people gathered along that street all the way down to South Station, and then several people in South Station. And at Send Relief, we try to engage all those different people groups weekly. And, uh, and we try to invite volunteers to come in and take part in learning what it's like to go out there and try to engage people who are on the street, just like this person in our story. These people in these stories that we read about in the Bible are not just people that are far off and distant, but they are the same types of people that we can encounter here today in our context. And so, what we want to look at here is what's especially important um, that's happening in this story. Remember, Peter and John are excited to go and proclaim the gospel. And so they're going up to this gathering point, and they probably have in their mind pictures in their minds of different people that they're going to encounter. Different good Jewish boys or Jewish girls they know are going to be at this place of prayer. And so they have in their minds a strategy for which they're going to then share the gospel. But then all of a sudden, as they're walking up to the temple, there's someone literally carried and placed right at their feet, right in their path. Now, I know you and I believe in the sovereignty of God, right? We believe that God is in control of everything. And so this is not an accident. It's not an accident that the very first person that they meet while they are out on mission as part of the very first church is someone who's desperate and trapped in poverty, someone who's trapped in brokenness. And this honestly should come as no surprise to you and to me that God would have it be like this because our God has always had a priority for the poor and for the desperate. And if we look at what our God, Jesus Christ, has said, what he was about, and what he did, we'll find that this is true. Look at Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 17. Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 17, we see that Jesus gets up and he speaks before the synagogue and he declares his mission statement. Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 17, says this, He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You see, brothers and sisters, to follow Jesus is to proclaim good news to the poor. And that's both those who are spiritually poor and those who are physically poor. We get into tremendous trouble and we just try to isolate it one way or the other. Now, if you're not convinced with that interpretation of Luke chapter 4, then just look at what the leadership of the early church told the Apostle Paul when he and his missionary band were about to head out and be sent out by them. He recounts this in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul says, Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to do. Those who are in poverty are a priority for Jesus. They were a priority to the early church. Are they a priority for us? As we consider our lives, is caring for those in such a state part of our regular walk? If the answer is no, then we're challenged right here to wonder if we're fully living on mission as Jesus intends, or if if maybe we're not engaging in caring for the poor and the vulnerable, and then we're not living on mission fully as Jesus intends. We only need to look at the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16 to see that God expects us to care for those who are at our proverbial gate because doing so shows whether or not we we truly know Christ and belong to him. And so what Luke is doing here is he loves to highlight Christ's heart for the poor throughout the gospel and throughout the book of Acts. And so what he's doing here is crystal clear. The first move of the apostles is a move that engages the poor and the desperate and shows that God has a priority for those in a similar situation. Now, what happens next here at the gate called Beautiful is something that is really spectacular. It's a man who presents as anything but beautiful, but he's cared for in a manner that radiates the beauty of God. And so with the remainder of our time today, I just want to look at this text and see exactly how he's cared for and pull out some principles for you and for me that we might know how to best engage the poor. And so the first thing that I want to identify for this text, this is our first point for today, is that the apostles treat the man with dignity. The apostles treat the man with dignity. Now, this man was sitting on the dust along the road with his head down, and Peter and John are are walking by him, and he's asking for charity. And our text tells us that instead of walking right past him or ignoring the man or judging the man, the text tells us that Peter 
directed his gaze at them. Verse 4. Peter directed his gaze at them, as did John. Now, perhaps you've been in a situation like this when someone's begging, and what's the first thing that we often tend to do? We look down, or we look past them, or we look at our phones. We look down, we look past them, or we look at our phones. We do our best to avoid the person who's right in front of us. What are we doing in those moments when we do that? In a sense, we're treating that person like they do not matter. And each time that we do this, it is a value pronouncement that is received clearly by that person that you are not worthy of my time, not even a glance. Now, why do we do that? Why do we react that way when we see people? You know, there was a comedian named Jerry Seinfeld, and he used to do these uh, comedic bits, and he actually had his own TV show for a while. And in one of his comedic bits, he tells the story of what it was like before he was famous, and he used to fly on airplanes. He talked about how he would fly in coach because he didn't have enough money to fly in first class. And he would peek through the curtain that used to divide first class and coach. And he would see people in there being given uh, nice little mints on their pillows or being given nice water with ice or a blanket or a pillow. And, and he, he said, you know, I, it was almost as though I, was, I could almost taste it. And then the stewardess came over and she saw me looking and she grabbed the curtain and she closed it. And it was almost as though she was looking at me to say, if you just tried a little harder in life, this could have been you. And I think, honestly, church, that's what we do with people on the street. We look at them and we judge them and we think, you're here because you deserve it. You're here because you're lazy. You haven't tried hard enough. You deserve what you get. And so as a result, you're not worthy of my time. But, you know, when we take that perspective, we don't know the whole story, right? We are not able to understand the truth of what that person has really been battling or gone through. We, we fail to live in the way that the Apostle Paul told us to live, to imitate Jesus and in humility count others as more significant than ourselves. And finally, when we look past people in desperate situations, we are failing to acknowledge the reality that there go I but for the grace of God. What if you got introduced to a substance early on in your life that you couldn't kick? Where would you be? What if you had a different set of parents who didn't love you in the way that they did? Where would you be? What if you found yourself abused or through some traumatic situation, deeply wounded? Where would you be? It's only the grace of God that any of us find ourselves where we're at. And we have to look at people in the same way. Peter and John don't judge this person, but instead they treat him with dignity by directing their gaze at him, by looking at him, and by giving this man their attention. They also don't just look at him, but what does the text tell us? The text tells us that they tell the man to look back at him, right? Look at us. We see this right here. Look at us. Now this man is probably discouraged, he's probably ashamed, he's probably tired, he's probably simply looking in the ground and just repeating the same call for generosity over and over and over again. And with this man's head lowered and his eyes sunken down in shame, Peter and John say to him, look at us, make eye contact with us. What Peter and John are doing is they're looking at him and recognizing that they in fact do see him. They want him to know, I see you. How many people want to be seen in their lives, right? I want to be seen, right? Because when we're seen, it means that we are valued. It means that people want to know us. It takes it to a deeper level. My daughter, Michaela, she has so much energy. From the moment she wakes up until the moment that she finally falls asleep. It's energy, energy, energy all the time. And so I take her to the playground a lot so that she can get that energy out. I don't know if any other parents in the room have done that before. It's a great, great tactic. And so when I take her to the playground, she wants me to watch her climb every single ladder, go down every single slide. She wants me to see every single move she does on the monkey bars. She wants me to watch her. But as any parent has, could uh, maybe confess when you're in that situation, sometimes you just you know, want some time to yourself, and sometimes you pull out your phone and you start to knock out some of those tasks that you need to knock out. And so that was me. I was sitting on the bench trying to fill out an insurance form on my phone, which... Uh, if anybody's ever tried to fill out an insurance form on your phone, it's frustrating and it takes a long time. So I was sitting there trying to do that and my daughter was going all across the playground and she kept shouting out over and over again, Daddy, see me, Daddy, see me, Daddy, see me.
Dad, see me. And I would say, yeah, Michaela, I see you. You're doing great. You know, but I was really looking at my phone, and she knew that, Dad, you're not seeing me. Dad, see me. And the personality of my daughter is she is a take-charge woman, and so she ran over, grabbed me by the face, and said, Dad, look at me. <laughs> so I had to. Now, what is she saying in that moment? But she's saying, I want to know that you are, that I am more important to you than your phone. How many people do we meet on the street that we don't give them the time of day, that we communicate to them that they are not important, they're not worthy of being seen? You see, when we do make eye contact, when we do look at them and when we, when we do invite them to look at us, what we're doing is this is a value exchange. It's part of what it means to affirm the Imago Dei, the image of God in every person. That regardless of what has happened to someone or what state they're in or what limitations they might have, that every human being is made in the image of God and worthy to be seen. There was a 16th century reformer who makes the point that because of the unity that we all have being made in the image of God, that when one of us is suffering, it should cause all of us to weep along with our Creator at the brokenness that is happening. But he also says, more than weep, this reformer contends, we must recognize that as recipients of God's grace, like everyone else on the planet, we are called to be those who engage in trying to help restore every single damaged image, every single warped image, because that, brothers and sisters, is what is happening to you through the power of Christ. You are being restored every single day. And so when Peter and John invite this man to look at them, they are declaring that you are made by God and you are valuable. They are respecting the man and they are respecting God by making eye contact with the lame beggar. Now, even more radical than looking at him, even more radical than inviting him to look back and make eye contact, suddenly we see that the apostles treat this man with dignity by reaching down and actually touching him. Look at verse 7. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. Now, back in those days, it would have been ceremonially unclean. It would have been the, the most ceremonially unclean thing for Peter and John to do, to touch someone who was in this condition. In fact, a person that was in this type of situation would have never been allowed to enter into the temple, not in their entire lives. And so by reaching out and touching him and healing him, by meeting his needs, the apostles have suddenly opened the door back up for him to have relationship. Relationships with others, physically that he desperately needs in that community of faith, but also relationship spiritually with the God that he desperately needs. What Peter and John have done here is the upside-down way of the kingdom. They've reached out and they've crossed all barriers and they've touched the lame beggar. In a world where this man would have rarely ever been given a handshake, let alone hugged or held, suddenly he's treated as if he were truly human, just like everyone else. Do you know that that's the reality of so many people who are on the street in our city? Not only are they never looked at, but they're never touched. And do you know the power of touch? There's tremendous power in touch. In fact, the New Yorker had an article called The Power of Touch where they talked about this and they said, touch is the first of the senses to develop in the human infant and it remains perhaps the most emotionally central throughout their lives. You know, the, the right kind of touch, it eases stress, it promotes safety, it allows for emotional healing. And in, in hospitals, in fact, it's not uncommon for people to come in and hold newborn babies who don't have anyone else to hold them because it is that essential to their development. There's power in touch. You know, the other day I was speed walking through South Station and I was running down to the red line to catch my train and I was kind of running late to get to my office and I had my headphones in and a half-eaten granola bar in my hand and, and as I'm racing down, all of a sudden I caught... I, caught, I saw someone out of the corner of my eye and it was this woman experiencing homelessness and she had all of her bags gathered around her and she was sitting in the corner. But that was not the only thing that I saw as I raced past, but I saw a woman about my age knelt down with her, holding her hands and praying with her. And all that I could do was extend a hand as I kept walking and I said a simple prayer, but what if my punctuality was not more important than people? What could God do in my life, in your life, if we followed Christ on mission and we stopped 
for the desperate and treated them with dignity? Could we build in minutes of margin just like we build in savings that we might be able to give? Could we build in minutes of margin that we might be able to reach out and engage with people who are desperate along the paths of our lives? This young woman that I saw, just like Peter and John, understood the power of touch and treated the one that she was praying for with a compassionate care. Now, while I'm talking about the unhoused poor here, this principle can also be applied to any of the people in your lives who are desperate, who are going through brokenness, whose lives are a mess. How are we treating them? Do we move towards them with respectful kindness or do we avoid them? The apostles treated this man with dignity. The second thing that we see here in the second point of our message is that the apostles addressed the, physical man, the man's physical needs first. The apostles addressed the man's physical needs first. Look at verse 6. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Peter and John, they did what they saw Jesus do over and over. They cared about the physical, physical condition of the person standing right in front of them to the point that they acted in a way that actually brought about healing. You remember the stories of Jesus going into a town and healing everybody in his presence. Or the stories of Jesus going multiple times and feeding thousands of people who had that need right in front of them. Now, I will acknowledge that what Peter and John did here, we won't always be able to do. They miraculously healed this man in the name of Jesus. And, and while healings do, do still happen, they are not as simple as you and me memorizing a phrase or just angling our hands in just the right way. I think what's important for us to know here, even if maybe we won't be able to see this happen every time, is that Peter and John saw someone in an under-resourced state and they cared for that man's physical needs first. He needed healing and they assisted him in meeting that need and they did it in the name of Jesus. Now notice that they didn't proclaim the gospel to him first. They didn't start off with uh, trying to get him to pray the sinner's prayer. Uh, they didn't start off with trying to get him baptized, become a member, and then prove faithful, and then finally say, okay, then we can try to help your physical needs. No, they met the need first. Now you might say, hold on a second, John, what about verse 16? Verse 16 seems to say that the man did place his faith in Jesus. Look at verse 16. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. But the reality is, Peter is saying these words not talking about the man's faith. He's talking about his own faith. He's talking about his faith in Jesus and the power of Jesus moving through him. The power of the kingdom on display is what brought about the healing for this man. In James chapter 5, the brother of Jesus talks about when the elders are praying for someone to be healed, and he states that it's the prayer of faith that makes the sick person well again. But you see, even in that passage, it's not the prayer of the person receiving that uh, laying on of hands. It's the prayer of the elders that brings about this miraculous gift of healing. The fact remains, Peter and John healed this man before giving him the gospel, before there was ever any conversion. They met the need first without any strings attached. Notice what they also didn't do. They also didn't give him money, right? They gave out of what they had. Now, there's nothing wrong with giving money to people that are in desperate and impoverished situations. In fact, I think that if we have it to give, we should be radically generous. But that's not what they do here, right? Maybe you might find yourself in front of someone who's broken and asking for money, and you may or may not have the means to give to them, but you will always have something to offer them that is healing and restorative. The power of God flowing through all of us, the gifts of the Spirit being manifested through us, that is what we can offer to people. If you have the gift of mercy, you can go and sit and talk and listen to somebody and cry with them, weep with them, hear them, be present with them. You can listen and talk. You can be a friend. 
At Send Relief, we have with, uh, this program called the Friendship Initiative, and it's led by a guy named Andrew, and weekly he goes out onto the street and he brings different uh, volunteers and, and sometimes regular volunteers to go out and meet needs of people who are on the street, people that are in those different locations that I already described, as well as going down to Mass and Cass over by the BMC and, and uh, what, what has been called Methadone Mile. Um, he goes down there as well as Maverick um, Station and Central Square and other places. But he leads teams into those locations. And what he urges those teams to do is to not count the number of meals that get handed out, but to count the number of minutes of conversation that you have with people. He encourages people to stop and think about potentially making the curb the table, where you might sit down with somebody and give them a sandwich, but also pull out a sandwich for yourself and share a meal together and talk with that person and display Christ-like friendship. He encourages people to not be transactional, but to be relational. All of us can do this. All of us can give out of what we have. And sometimes that relationship is exactly what people need more than anything else, is they need to see someone who radiates the character of God and who cares for them. You see, we're all called to glorify God by loving Him above all else and by loving our neighbors as ourselves. And I don't know about you, but if it's the winter and I'm cold, I'm going to love myself and go get myself a jacket. If, if I'm hungry, I'm going to love myself and go get some Tasty Burger or if I'm on a diet, Sweet Greens. If I'm in a place where I'm thirsty, I'm going to go and love myself and go get a coffee from Tate. Are we too looking at others and saying, how can I love them just like I would love myself? How can I care for my neighbors, which include everybody made in the image of God? How can I love them? Meeting physical needs is an important part of following Jesus. Again, the brother of Jesus, James says this in James chapter 2, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Peter and John, they heal a man with what they have to offer, displaying the power of the kingdom, and they do it in the name of Jesus. The third thing that we see here is that the apostles proclaimed the gospel. The apostles proclaimed the gospel. Look at verse 11. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. And then he shared the gospel. And, and we see that key phrase uh, in verse 19. Repent, therefore, turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And so we see in the story that as people were uh, running to see the evidence of the kingdom power on display in this healed man, a man that was still holding on to his new friends, that Peter showed the lame beggar and everyone who saw what had happened, what he and all of them needed most, not just to be healed in this temporal life, but to have their souls healed forever in the name of Jesus. The pastor and theologian John Piper says, we, we Christians care about all suffering, especially eternal suffering. Now, there's one important thing to note about how they shared the gospel here. Peter and John only did it when God opened the door. It wasn't until the crowds flocked and there was an open door that Peter and John proclaimed the good news. You see, church, we've got to be really careful about force-feeding the gospel on people. You know, it looks like when we do that, that we're providing good news with strings attached. And it makes everything look very transactional. And if you've been in those situations before and you've talked to people on the street and you've tried to meet needs and then share the gospel, guess what? Those people have seen several people just like you. And they've gone through it before. And so it's not uncommon for people in those situations to just, you know, let you pray the prayer with them and then get you out of the way because they know what this is. It's not really authentic. It's not really genuine. You know, when I first got involved in ministry, I was, uh, I was living in Waltham, Massachusetts, and I was going out, and I, I love to share the gospel on the street all the time, and I think it's a really good thing to do, and I, I, I just, I embraced it. And so I went out sharing the gospel with as many people as I could, uh, almost daily. I would run up to cars and talk to people uh, while they were waiting in traffic. 
But I remember this one guy that I was talking to. I ran up to him, and, and he was sitting in a wheelchair, and I was talking to him about the gospel, and I was on my third point, and he stopped me, and he looked at me, and he said, Brother, do you even know my name? And I was cut to the core. I was treating him like a number. I was treating him in a transactional way. I didn't even take a moment to learn about his life. I didn't take a moment to learn about the questions that he was asking or the doubts that he had or to uncover what he already knew about God. If we serve, care, love, and bless, if we act with compassion, we need to remember that we need to treat people with dignity and we need to wait on God's timing so that when God opens the doors, we run right through it and we boldly proclaim the good news. Remember, it's the Holy Spirit who saves. It's not you or me with how winsome of a presentation that we have. It's the Holy Spirit who's going to open the door. Are we prepared to give answers for our faith when those moments happen? So in conclusion, this passage shows us the power of the kingdom that sees people with dignity, that meets needs in a way that restores, and that shares the gospel when God opens the door so that people might enter the presence of God. Now at the beginning, I told you that we're to care for the, the, the poor because simply that is who God is. And we're taking part in doing what Jesus did, what he does, and how he cares for us. And that's true. But brothers and sisters, there's one thing that we can't miss in all of this. The reason that we care for the desperate that we find in our lives is because, brothers and sisters, that's us. We are the ones who are broken, who are desperate, in a heap in the dust. And it's Jesus who, by his great mercy, turned his gaze towards, his gaze towards us. And it's Jesus who gave us eyes to see so that we might look back at him. And it's Jesus who reached through the barriers and took us by the hand, healing us once unto salvation and continuing to heal us every day of the wounds of this world. And it's Jesus who made it possible so that we could enter the presence of God. You see, when we recognize our own desperation and how compassionate Christ was and is towards us, then it becomes a joy to care for others in those physical conditions because we present to them a picture of the gospel that God restores all things. So who is it that God is calling you to stop and minister to a bit more each day? Who is it that you can think of? Someone that you see on your way to work, someone that's in your neighborhood, someone that you run across as you're going to school or you're picking up your kids or bringing them to a playground. You know, at Send Relief, we have different initiatives that partner, uh, different initiatives and partners who care for everyone in the quartet of the vulnerable, the poor, the widows, the orphans, and the sojourner. And if you don't know where to start, then I'd love for you to reach out to me afterwards, and I'd love to be able to show you some of the ways at our ministry center where we help to mobilize people just like you into action. And maybe for the first time, as you're listening to this message, you're realizing that you are desperate and that Jesus has directed his gaze upon you. And now you can see him. And maybe today, for the first time, you can see his hand reached out to you, inviting you to be healed. I plead with you as one who's been restored. Take Jesus by the hand today. Turn from your sin and place your trust in him and find what your soul has always needed most, the rescue of God in Christ. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this passage. We thank you for what's woven in, in it, just this beautiful uh, model of what it looks like to engage someone in a desperate, vulnerable, and impoverished situation. God, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to continue to cast our eyes in the direction that your eyes are always aimed at. Those who are most desperate, those who are most vulnerable. And God, I pray, Lord, that as we continue to engage with people, you would help us, Lord, to seek the most healthy ways to reach out. And Lord, as we do all of this, I pray, Lord, that we would never disconnect from the reality that this is everything responding to the gospel in us, of how you have rescued us and saved us. We pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.